So why did people obey? One could be our culture, which we are immersed in from a very young age. Basically, we are socialized to obey authority figures, whether it be teachers, parents, police officers, etc. So when we're in a situation, someone who is an authority figure telling us what to do, we often, our first thought is to obey. Next, we have the perceived expertise of the experimenter. So why do they think that they are experts? Well, at the very least, the experimenter is wearing a lab coat. Also, the study is taking place at Yale, which is a very prestigious school. Next, we've got the foot in the door technique, which basically means you've already, well, it increases in 15 volt increments and you've already done one and so it's just a little bit each time little more than the last one and it's difficult to really think about disobeying when you've already done that little bit in the first place it's not like it's jumping from 15 to 100 or that big of a difference feels like it means more when it's a 15 volt increment it doesn't seem like as much i'm in this far might as well keep going that kind of mentality uh, moral disengagement as well they don't really feel responsible for what they've what they're doing they're not morally holding themselves responsible because someone else is telling them to do it Next is a, remain, a need for consistency. Basically thinking about you already did it at 180. And so if it's going up to 195 now, what has really changed there? If you thought it was okay at 180, you would also believe it is okay at 195. That makes sense. So you need to remain consistent and your feelings about doing this action. Next, a change in self-perception. Um, so agreeing to smaller requests um, can change the way that you think about yourself and what you might do. So Participants are seeing themselves as someone who does follow the experimenter's orders and did to that time. And so having a difference in what you're going to believe about yourself happen some point during the experiment is difficult to do. It's also a brand new situation. So if you think back to earlier in this lecture, I was talking about some situation that you've never been in before. How do you know how you're going to behave? You really don't know what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do given a brand new situation. Not really sure what to do and that's a little bit, um, can be confusing. So you don't know how to act. When we're in those novel situations, we often will look to others, like the experimenter. Um, this person wasn't acting like there was anything wrong, and so that helps you continue on feeling that everything is okay. So there were many different replications of this study. And Milgram tried to see when people would obey and when people would not obey. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So when didn't people obey? When an ordinary person gave the orders. So if it was someone that was supposedly the experimenter, they gave, um, they followed more. But if it was just an ordinary person, 
they weren't as likely to obey. So the prestige, the flip side of that, the prestige actually does make a difference here. When the proximity to the experimenter was low. So what does this mean? Proximity means distance. And so when the proximity to the experimenter was very close versus very far. I think the way this is said is a little confusing actually, but when the um, teacher was closer to the experimenter, they were more likely to obey. But when they were farther apart, like in a different room, the teacher was more likely to disobey. Hopefully that makes sense. There we go. So gave instructions by the phone. Or also when the proximity to the learner was high. So when they were very close to the learner, like in the same room as the learner, or in one of the variations, the teacher had to hold the learner's um, hand on a shock plate. Um, so when they're actually very close, it makes it easier to, to disobey. Another variant they did is when others disobeyed. So people would not obey if there was, maybe there were two teachers in the room uh, and one of the teachers disobeyed, then the other teacher was more likely to disobey as well. All right, there were, like I said, many different follow-up studies. One of them was the location of the study. Um, so at Bridgeport instead of Yale, Bridgeport, it's kind of like a made up place. It wasn't at a school, it was at a, I'm forgetting right now. Maybe it was an institute, but it was basically an office building. Um, obedience was still pretty high, but it wasn't as high as at Yale. Women and college students still very high, so women weren't going to be any more sympathetic to not hurting people than men. Sorry, ladies, college students as well. And it was also replicated in other countries, and we're seeing similar results. What do we think about things happening like this today? they actually were able to do a very similar study um, by Dr. Berger in 2009. It was actually done at Santa Clara, which is very close to Fresno. Because there were a lot of ethical issues with the original study, there were things that needed to change for it to happen in more recent times. So what changed? They only went to 150 volts so although the teacher still thought that um, they were shocking the other person, even though they weren't, they weren't allowed to go to 450 and maybe led to believe that they killed the person. So the solution was that they didn't go as high and would minimize the amount of um, strain put on the teacher, that emotional strain. There was a much more detailed screening process. Um, they looked for any kind of psychological issues, things like that. And if there were any potential issues there, then they did not allow them to participate in the study. They also have to screen for people that know about the study. Um, very likely didn't allow psychology majors, things like that, because they already likely knew about the original study, so it wouldn't have worked. Um, repeated reminders that the participants could withdraw from the study at any time without any penalty so they didn't feel unduly coerced. Um, one thing I didn't say previously was that in the beginning the um, teacher was given a sample shock of 450 volts in the original Milgram study or studies. 
Um, and so that was actually the only real shock given to anybody because the um, learner was obviously not being shocked. But in this um, replicating Milgram study, it was now 15 volts instead of 450, so it's lower. Now debriefing occurred seconds after the study ended instead of you know minutes to minimize that time they thought they hurt someone else. And the experimenter wasn't an actor like the previous study, but a clinical psychologist. So if they were having any issues um, in processing what they did, they could talk to someone immediately that could help them. So although um, Milgram was the person that thought of and ran the study, the experimenter role was done by an actor in the original study. So Milgram was like behind a, a one-way mirror instead of um, actually conducting the study, if that makes sense. So what actually happened in this study? Do we think there were a lot of changes? Not so much. Um, obviously we can't say completely for certain because they didn't go up to 450 volts, but 70% went to for 150 volts. So we are still having a lot of following orders here. And Berger stated that it is um, pretty much the way that they acted 45 years ago. We have the same situational factors that affected obedience that they're still operating today. So it's important to fully consider what's going on in the situation. I understand it is difficult for us to believe that if we were put in the same situation that we would hurt somebody else. People often say, I'm a good person, I don't hurt other people, etc. But you're missing the point of the situational factors if you're stating that. Think back to the fundamental attribution error when we're talking about um, going only to dispositional factors in discounting the situation. If you're saying you're a good person so you wouldn't do it, is not thinking about the situation. You're doing the same fundamental attribution error. You're only thinking about the attributes of the person and that's not going to necessarily fully explain what's going on. So the high rate of obedience, both in the original studies and this replication of Berger's that was published in 2009, shows just how powerful the situation can be in determining obedience. Um, this one is an example to show, again, another way that these things could happen today. It's not required, but it's pretty interesting. Let's go ahead and watch it if you like. And we'll stop here for now. <laughs> 